Brothers, the copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Calling all cars, Denton all cars, San Francisco police calling all cars, Denton broadcast 127. We are on the lookout for a man described 5 foot 10, 130 pounds, gray hair. This suspect is wanted for questioning in connection with the burglaries in the marina and on Knob Hill. That's all. driver of a police car or a fire engine, with human life depending upon your ability to save seconds in speeding to the rescue, you'd certainly select your gasoline carefully. You'd test many brands to find the fastest gasoline. You'd make tests for power, for quick starting. Well, that's exactly the way large cities and counties select their gasoline. Isn't it convincing proof of the overwhelming superiority of Rio Grande cracked gasoline that it is specified to power more police, fire, and emergency equipment than any other brand everywhere it is sold? Your own life may depend upon starting your car quickly, upon instantaneous response to acceleration to snatch your car out of danger in traffic emergencies. It costs you no more to enjoy police car performance in your own car. You can get Rio Grande cracked gasoline with tetraethyl, identically the same gasoline police cars use at your neighborhood independent service station at no extra cost. And you will find that your car operates so much more efficiently on this patented processed gasoline that you get more miles to the gallon. The largest cities and counties of the West have found that emergency gasoline is more economical. So will you if you use Rio Grande cracked gasoline. And now it is our great pleasure to present Sheriff Murphy of San Francisco County, who will speak to you from the studios of station KFRC in San Francisco. Sheriff Murphy. Good evening. At this time of the year, our attention is focused upon the boys of our nation who will be the leaders of tomorrow. All over the country, boys are being extolled to virtue, inspired to emulate their fathers, told of the debt they owe their parents. But there is a debt the parents owe the child. The father must give the child something to emulate the proper guidance, the proper character for the child to respect. In the drama you are about to hear, the father failed miserably in this duty, and through the inscrutable workings of blind destiny, his very failure in his duty to his child worked his downfall. I hope that every father listening to this broadcast will heed its moral. Not that every father has a criminal record or ever will have one, but that he may realize how important is every word and thought is to the children whose duty it is to guide to a useful maturity. <laughs> During the recreation hour in the prison yard in Folsom Penitentiary. Well, Red, I get my papers next week. Yeah? Yeah, the board finally got around to giving me a parole. Gee, that's fine. Hey, what are you going to do when you get out? What do you think? Going back to the racket? Sure. Listen, I did a sleep in Quentin and another in Walla Walla. And why? Because I made mistakes. Well, I've been doing a lot of thinking since I've been up here. And I know how to beat the rap every time now. Yeah? What's the system, huh? Think I tell you? Listen, all you need to know is this. I'm going to clean up when I get on the outside, and the copper ain't born that'll ever catch up with me. And two weeks later, Henry Edwards... 
Goldberg leaves the prison with his secret scheme of police-proof crime. Goes direct to San Francisco to a little house in the Mission District. Hello there. Oh, Henry. Hello, Pop. Well, well, Bobby. Golly, how you've grown. Sure, Pop. Henry, how are you? Fine, just fine. Oh, I'm so glad you're there. It's been hard, Henry. So hard without you. Yeah, I guess it must have been. Where you been, Pop? Why, I've I... told you a hundred times, Bobby. Your daddy's been on a business trip. See, it's a funny kind of business that takes you away that long. Yes, Bobby, it is. A funny kind of business. Now, now run along and play. Yeah, but gee, I want to Go ask... on, Bobby. You heard your mother now scram. Scram? What's that mean, Pop? Run along, Bobby. Oh, all right. You should be ashamed, Henry, teaching that child the dirty things you learned up in that place. Hmm. Huh? What? What are you talking about? That word you used. What word? Scram? Yes. Why, that isn't dirty. It just means... I don't care what it means. I don't want to know. There are some things you don't seem to realize, Henry Edwards. The things I've been going through. How I've shielded from your child the fact that his father's a, a convict. How I've lied to him and to everybody else about my husband. You're ashamed of me, huh? Well, Henry, it, it isn't very nice to have to hide the truth. I'm getting tired, Henry. Worn down. I lost faith in everything. When they sent you away the first time and we were living in Seattle, I was hurt. But I tried to excuse you and forgive you. You promised you'd go straight when you got out. Well, you did. You went straight to San Quentin as fast as you could. And I forgave you again. But I'd lost hope by then. And I was right. Bobby had his father with him only six months and they sent you to Folsom. What kind of a life do you think that is for me, Henry? A fine kind of a home atmosphere to bring up a child in. You think it's been any kind of a life for me? Sitting in a cold cell day after day, wondering how you and the kid are? You were in that cell of your own doing, Henry. And if you were half a man, you'd have the decency to go straight. Oh, I'm not saying it for myself. I don't count anymore. You took the best years of my life to prison with you. But for Bobby's sake, give him a father to be proud of. You haven't changed a bit, have you, Mildred? What do you mean? Still reading the riot act. I got out of stir and come home wanting comfort, a good meal, understanding. And what do I get? The pants nagged off of me. Oh, how little you understand, honey. Yeah, a lot I you... said all I'm going to say. If you have a single atom of manhood in your body, you'll know what to do. Oh, I'll cook you good meals, Henry. I'll give you a comfort... I'll be your housekeeper. But for the sake of your son, you ought to do the right thing. He's what both of us have got to live for now. I'm meaning to do the right thing, Mildred. This time it's going to be different. I've got something lined up. I'll start making money. You won't never be ashamed of me again. I'm through with being a tin horn crook. Oh, Henry. If I could only believe you. Later the same day, Henry Edwards enters an apartment house on Silver Street, rings the bell of apartment 108. Hey. In person. Oh, darling, come on in, sit down, tell me all about yourself. When did you get out? Come here. No, don't say anything. Kiss me first. There. That's better. Oh, I've been missing that. So have I. Have a drink? Sure. Here you are. Here's to us. To us. Place hasn't changed much. I've kept it just the way it was, waiting for you to come back. Swell. What you gonna do now? I got plans. They're never gonna put me away again. I'm gonna clean up, and then you and I are going away for good. Nothing would suit me better. Listen, I learned plenty in the big house. That place is a university, and I got a master's degree. Now, here's the dope. I told the old woman I'm going straight, see? Saves a lot of argument. So I'll work out of this joint. Anything you say goes with me. That's the way I like to hear you talk, baby. I'll tell the old lady I got a job at night somewhere, and that'll leave me free at nights to go on me a bankroll. Oh, officer, thank heavens you've come. I declare I'm afraid to stay in this house even in the daytime after what's happened. Well, just what has happened? Now? I've been robbed. When? Last night, when I was asleep, I went to bed about 11 o'clock. 
And when I got up this morning, all my jewels were gone. Somebody had come right into my bedroom and gone through my jewel case. I can't understand why I didn't wake up. I'm such a light sleeper. Did you lock all the doors and windows before you went to bed? Indeed, I did. Ever since Mr. Watkins passed on, he was my third husband, you know. I've been very careful to lock up securely. I don't even have a window open at night. I'm that frightened of living alone. Mm. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh... Uh, any signs of the windows or doors being jimmied? No, none whatever. They're just the same as when I locked them last night. Well, we'll have the fingerprint man go over the house for prints. And if you'll give me a description of the missing property... Well, there was a three-carat solitaire set in platinum, and a baguette watch with 15 diamonds, and an emerald broke. <laughs> Morning. Yeah. Three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, that's right it is. I heard you come in at seven this morning. A little late, weren't you? Yeah, we had to work overtime down to docks. The fog held that New Zealand freighter off the gate most of the night, and we had to get her cargo off as soon as she docked. You like a cup of coffee? Yeah. I got some hot for you. Thanks. Uh, Henry. Yeah? I want to talk to you about Bobby. What's wrong with him? Nothing's wrong with him. Well? Don't you think you ought to get acquainted with him? What do you mean? Well, the boy scarcely knows you. You scarcely know him. You spend most of the years since he was born in prison. Now, Mildred, don't start harping on that again. I don't intend to. Only now you work all night and sleep all day. What do you mean all day? It's only 3 o'clock. Yes, he'll be going off somewhere like he always do in another half hour. Well, what of it? Couldn't you spend a little time with a child? He adores you. Can't you return a little bit of his affection? Yeah, I guess you're right. He's a good kid. What do you say I take him to a movie this afternoon? Oh, he'd love it. All right, I'll do that. Where is he? He's playing out front. I'll go out and get him right away. We just got time for the second show. Pop, that was a swell show. Like it? Yeah, boy, that place where the trigger man fights it out with a cop. Gee, that was exciting. Those cops were plenty brave, weren't they, Pop? Going in there against a machine gun? Cops ain't so brave, Bobby. Yeah, but in the picture... There was 15 cops against one mug. That ain't very brave, is it? No, I guess not. But I always thought... Take it from your old man, Bobby. Cops ain't got no backbone. Where are we going now, Pop? To see a friend of mine. That is, if you can keep a secret. What do you mean? I don't think your mother would understand if you told her we came here. Okay, I won't tell her. Is that a promise? Promise. All right, up the stairs with him. Well, for the love of Mike, what's this? This is Bobby, Edna. I thought you two ought to get acquainted. Well, hello, Bobby. Hello. Come on in. Talk yourself. I've uh, got something out here that little boy is like. Hey, Pop, how come she called you Daddy? Huh? Oh, uh, uh, you see, I, I'm like a father to her. Yeah? Like you are to me? Well, yeah, it's sort of. Gee. Here we are, Bobby. Some nice chocolate candies for you. Gosh, thanks. How about you, Daddy? Want a drink? Next, next. Of uh, tea? Yeah, I'll come out in the kitchen with you while you make it. All right. Here's some books with pictures in them, Bobby. Thanks. The idea of looking that kid over here. The old lady made me take him out to a movie, and I had to see you. Is everything okay? What do you mean? The bulls haven't been around, have they? Why should they? I thought you had a foolproof system. They have, but I'm still a little nervous. It's so long since I pulled the job. Well, don't you worry, honey. I've got all the stuff safely hidden away in my closet. Now, you better get that kid home to his mama before he gets wise. I'll see you later. Okay. Well, Bobby, let's get started home. No, I don't want to. Why not? I like you, and I like Edna. 
She's prettier than Mom, ain't she, Pop? Well, yes, I guess she is. Of course, Mom's nicer, I guess. There ain't nobody nice Mom, is there, Pop? Well, now, come on, Bobby. We're going home, I said. San Francisco Police Department. Burglary detail. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I got the address. We'll send some men out right away. Come on, Terry. Another one of those midnight burglaries. 1118. Yeah. Is that the apartment number? Yeah. Oh, here it is. The end of the hall. Gentlemen. We're from the burglary squad. Yes, I've been expecting you. Come in. Quiet, I say. Quiet now. You certainly have a couple of wide awake watchdogs there. Mm, that's the mystery of this whole thing. You heard them just now when you rang the bell? Yeah. I thought they'd tear us apart. Yeah, but they never woke while our apartment was being robbed. Are you sure of that? Possibly. Uh, I was awakened by some drunk who had the wrong phone number and... As soon as the bell rang, the dogs began to bark. But there was no sound before that. Hardly seems possible. The man could work so quietly that he wouldn't wake a pair of police dogs. Yeah, but apparently he did. Mm. I, I was going to shoot the dogs in the morning, but they seemed to be alert enough when you arrived. <laughs> Perhaps you've saved their life. Oh, just what have you lost? Everything. All my wife's jewels and even my billfold from the pocket of my trousers, which were hung up in the closet. How many entrances are there to this apartment? Just this door and the service door to the kitchen. It's still bullet. No dipping mark from this door. Was it locked? Securely. I brought the windows. Did they go out on any fire escapes? No, uh, it's 11 stories down the street. And your burglar must have let himself in this door. Well, he's a mighty slick worker to have gotten away with that. Better have the fingerprint man sent up, Terry. And I'm getting a description of the stolen goods, all right? For months, such burglaries occur with exhausting regularity. Yet police can find no trace of the stolen goods in the pawn shop. Nor can they discover a single fingerprint at the scene of the crime. All over the Bay District, Edwards carries on his one-man crime wave while authorities can only wait for the day when he will attempt to unload his loot. And then, into the robbery squad one morning, comes an excited uniformed officer. Captain, I got a burglary to report. Where? At my house. What? Yes, sir. And I think it's this mystery guy we can't get a line on. Same M.O., no print, no Jimmy. What'd he get? Some jewelry and money and my gun. Your gun? Yes, sir, my gun. Here's the number of it. If he tries to sell that, we'll have a line on it. You bet we will. Thanks for reporting, Mr. Foster, McNulty. I'll have every pawn shop in town on the lookout for that gun within an hour. A week later, the Western Empire Loan Company reports that the wanted gun has been pawned with them. Inspector Gable interviews the proprietor at once. Hello, Inspector. Hello, Abe. Let's see that police policy that you called me about. Sure, yes. Uh, here it is. Uh, mm. Seven, four, three, eight, eight, seven. That's McNulty's gun, all right. When was it pawned? I gave the fellow six dollars for it this morning. What do you look like? Well, he was about 35 years old, I guess. A guy about five foot ten, maybe. You know, sandy hair. And... Any scars or other identifying marks? Well, he looks sort of cockeyed in the right eye. Uh, yes, in the right eye, eh? Uh -huh. What's his name? Uh, Ralph Moore. Address? Mount Vernon Hotel. You ever see him before? Oh, sure. He's been selling stuff to me for a long time. Yes. Yeah. What kind of stuff? Oh, loose stones. He comes in every now and then with his diamonds or rubies or emeralds. Why didn't you report it? Well, you know, you never asked for a report on loose stones. You wanted to report on certain pieces of jewelry that were stolen. Yeah, that's right. But loose stones. That gives me an idea why we haven't located any of this stuff before. You mean he's breaking them up? Sure. Peddling the stones one place and the melted gold and silver another. Hmm. Pretty smart gag. Yeah. Now listen, Abe. You keep your eyes open for this guy who calls himself Ralph Moore. The next time he comes in with some stones to sell, you tip me off and stall him until I get here. Sure thing, Inspector. You can count upon me. Several days go by during which police learn that Ralph Moore is unknown at the Mount Vernon Hotel. 
Then one morning, the proprietor of the pawn shop tips Inspector Gopal that the suspect is in his shop. While the officer rushes to the place, the pawnbroker stalls for time. Well, um, <clears throat> it looks to me as though there's a bad flaw in this diamond. You're nuts. That stone's perfect. No, I don't think I could give you more than twenty-five dollars for it. Twenty-five dollars? Yeah. Well, that piece of ice is worth hundred and fifty. Yeah, but how do I know it ain't hot? Hot? Then I told you I'm a jewelry broker. This stuff's okay. The guy here? Uh, yes, uh, that, that's him. Come on along, you. What for? We want to have a heart-to-heart talk with you down at headquarters. <laughs> Your name? Thomas Moore. And I'm a jewelry broker. Yeah, so I heard you say. Where do you live? The Mount Vernon Hotel. You're lying on both counts, my friend. We've already checked that story. They never heard of you at the Mount Vernon. Well, that's funny. I can't understand. All right, now let's stop beating around the bush. Listen, you guys ain't got nothing on me. Yeah, we got a lot of interesting unmounted stones that well, you'll have to explain. I can explain them. A guy gave him to me to sell. Yeah, that's a likely story. I suppose he gave you that police positive the fellow we could go to. Yeah. Who is this friend of yours? You wouldn't want me to double-cross a pal, would you? No, of course not. Well, seeing as you're innocent, maybe you'll tell us your right name. Uh, my name's Henry Edwards. Henry Edwards, eh? Where do you live? Out on Evergreen Avenue, 1625. Fine. We'll just check on that story. Come on, Harrison. It's a Terry. Don't let this bird sell you any hot emeralds while we're gone. Don't worry. Inspector Gable and his partner drive out to the address given them by Edwards. Mrs. Edwards knows all too well who they are when she answers the door. Yes. Does Henry Edwards live here? Yes. Are you Mrs. Edwards? Yes. You're police officers, aren't you? That's right. What's he done now? Big pardon, ma'am? Oh, your husband's been in trouble before, eh? Why, uh, that is... No, I I just thought he might be drunk or something. No, ma'am, he isn't drunk. Well, what is it you want? We want to ask you some questions. Very well. Does your husband work? Yes. Where? He works on the Embarcadero. Night shift. Where exactly on the Embarcadero? Why, he... He never did say. Ain't likely he picked up them sparklers on one of the docks, Gable. No. Uh, Mrs. Edwards, we just took your husband into custody. He had several hundred dollars worth of unmounted stones on him. Do you have any idea where he got them? What? I know. I haven't. He never discussed them with you? Never showed them to you? No. Mrs. Edwards, do you know anyone who was associated with your husband? No. If he had any friends, he never brought them around here. Would you have any objections if we searched your house? <laughs> Wouldn't do me any good if I had, would it? Come on in. The two officers thoroughly searched the Edward home, find nothing. At last, convinced of the woman's innocence in the case, they leave the house. At the curb, they find young Bobby eagerly inspecting the police car. Well, young fella, you think you'll buy it? Your cop takes it. Where'd he take it? Oh, six, huh? My pop says cops ain't got no backbone. Oh, he does, does he? How does he know? I don't know, but if he says so, it's so. Where do you live? In there. Oh, then you must be Henry Edwards' little boy. Yeah, I'm Bobby. Listen, make the siren go, will you? Say, Bobby, uh, what's your pop do? Does he work? Yeah, down on the dock. Let me see your gun, will you? Sure. Take a look. Gee, it's a big one. Uh-uh. Mustn't touch it, Bobby. Might go off. Yeah? Sure. Ever see your pop with a gun like this, Bobby? Uh-uh. Who's your pop hang out with, Bobby? I don't know. Does anybody ever come over to the house? Nope. Doesn't your pop ever go to visit anyone? Sometimes. Make the siren go, will you? In a minute. Uh, who's he go to visit? Well, I went over to Edna's with him once. Edna? Who's she? Well, she's sort of a sister of mine, I guess. Because she calls Pop Daddy. Oh, she uh, does, does she? Yeah, she's awful nice. She gave me candy. Only Pop told me not to tell Mom we went over there. And I didn't. Uh, uh, That was very wise, Bobby. Just uh, where does this Edna live? 
Oh, it isn't far from the movie. What movie? The one's over by the park. What's the street address? I don't know. Well, what's Sedna's last name? I don't know. Take this hour and go, will you? Say, do you think you'd recognize Edna's place if you saw it again, Bobby? Yeah, I guess so. Well, how would you like to take a ride in the car? Do you make the sound go? Sure. Gee, let's go. Although the police car starts its journey with sirens screaming, it enters the neighborhood where Edna lives in silence. Bobby, although disappointed that the officers have turned off the exciting sound, leads them directly to Edna's apartment. As they are walking down the hall, the inspector pauses. Which door is hers, Bobby? That one across the hall. Well, now I'll tell you what let's do. You knock on the door, and Mr. Harrison and I'll keep out of sight, and we'll surprise her. Okay. Come on, Harrison. Keep your eyes open. There may be some other motors. All right. Hello, Edna. Well... Hello, Bobby. Where's your dad? Why, I don't... He brought some friends with him this time instead, ma'am. I'm Inspector Gable of the police department, and this is Inspector Harrison. Why, Bobby, you little thing. Huh? What's that mean, Edna? I'll show you what it means, you little brat. Yeah, take it easy, ma'am. Why, gee, Edna, don't be mad at me. I ain't done nothing. These cops took me for a ride, and they blew the siren for me. I told them how nice you were, so they wanted to come and visit you. Got any candy today, Edna? Oh, you... Yeah, not so loud, ma'am. You know, I, I think we'd better all go inside. Well, you wouldn't want your neighbors to know you was entertaining the law, would you? Okay. Come on in. Now, what's the beat? You probably read in the papers about these midnight burglaries that have been pulled for the last six months. I don't remember anything about it. Well, we picked up Henry Edwards with a pocket full of loose stones. He's the same man described to us who pawned a revolver which was stolen from a police officer's home recently. We've gone through Mr. Edwards' house and found nothing. Our junior policeman, young Bobby here, tells us... I ain't no junior policeman. When I grow up, I'm going to be another Dillinger. Huh? <laughs> you better take my advice and change your mind about that, young fellow. Anyway, Bobby tells us you're a pretty good friend of Edwards. Now, is that right? I don't know anything. Say, what's that big flat-foot pal of yours doing in the kitchen? Get out of there, you. You ain't got no search warrant. I don't need one. Just found a drawer full of watch movements and ring shanks in there, Gable. Yeah, I thought this was probably the plant. Well, Edna. What am I supposed to do, break out in a cold sweat? You might help us by telling us all you know. You don't seem to need any help. You seem to be pretty good at finding out the answers for yourself. Say, Edna, how about some candy? You got some. If I did, my little darling, I'd certainly give you a piece filled with strychnine. Confronted with the evidence against him, Edwards quickly confesses and eagerly brags about his prowess as a burglar. He's brought to trial, pleads guilty, and is sentenced to Folsom Penitentiary for the term prescribed by law. Just before he leaves for the prison, he is permitted to say goodbye to his son. Bobby, the officers told me what you did. See, Pop, I didn't know. I wouldn't have said anything if I knew. I don't blame you, Bobby. I had this joke coming to me. But, Bobby, there's something I want to say to you. The inspector said you told him you wanted to be like Dillinger when you grew up. Yeah. It's a bum steer, kid. I know I've never been much of a father to you, but you believe what I tell you, don't you? Sure I do, Pop. All right, then. Listen to me. Never break the law, no matter what. You can't win, Bobby. I know. I've been breaking the law for years, and I've been paying the hard way. Get those screwy ideas about gangsters out of your head. They're a bunch of yellow rats. They ain't heroes. I know. You mean gangsters ain't brave? No. But you said once that coppers ain't brave either. Well, I was a little off on that one, Bobby. Coppers have got it all over, gangsters. Stick on the right side. Sure, Pop. I ain't gonna be a gangster. Oh, and, uh, Bobby. Yes, Pop? Don't say ain't on account of its bum English. The young actor who tonight played the part of little Bobby is a full-fledged member of Rio Grande's junior police department. 
He is now wearing a glittering badge, a Sam Brown officer's belt, and has a gun that flashes fire. He has a complete scientific G-Man outfit at home, all furnished free by Rio Grande. Every boy and girl can have the same complete set of 15 free gifts. Just ask the independent dealer in your neighborhood who sells Rio Grande cracked gasoline. And here is a timely warning for every motorist. It's time to change to a lighter motor oil. Don't guess which grade your car needs. Go to your Rio Grande dealer. He has been trained in Sinclair scientific lubrication. He knows exactly which grade of oil or grease should be applied to every moving part of your car. And he is skilled in the correct application of the Sinclair law of lubrication, the first truly scientific method of ensuring correct automobile lubrication. You'll need to lean tomorrow. Drive into your Rio Grande dealer. Fill up with cracked gasoline and ask how the Sinclair law of lubrication can reduce operating costs of your car. Calling all cars, attention all cars, San Francisco police calling all cars, cancellation broadcast 127, suspect in this case now in custody, that's all. Frederick.